Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. We have the one and only Anne LaFleur. Anne has a, a plethora of experience in a variety of different industries and verticals. Uh, a brief synopsis on her is she started in 1977 working with microfiche, microfiche film process electronic tapes, transferring documents. Uh, she's worked with computer programming and network. Uh, she worked primarily in the government and then she left that job and was, she was found herself in French Polynesia to help with bringing uh, the first iteration of the internet to that uh, part of the world. Um, she's expanded her business mindset to data recovery uh, and then she started working from home in her own self-based business. Uh, she is the co-founder of the well-known book called Bonds for the Win with her colleague, Michelle Klan. And she's continued to help people throughout the world in this capacity. And now she's focusing her next efforts on a world humanitarian project shortly, uh, specifically keying in on the South Pacific. And welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me today. Oh, it's our, it's our pleasure. So, um, and first things first on the people mostly know us for the, the financial component. So we'll start with that. As you're well aware, there's a ton going on throughout the entirety of the world, uh, politically, financially, especially because we key in on Iraq. Uh, they have now just announced their elections are coming up on the 18th and should finalize, I believe, by the 20th. I think they've invested roughly 20% of their budget. So my, my understanding is that they have to invest the rest of it in the next five days, which puts us in right around the end of the year into January. Uh, just would love to get your insights on both Iraq, what you see happening and whatever other things economically throughout the world that have come across your desk. Well, I honestly do not, sorry about that. That's okay. I honestly do not uh, follow a whole bunch of podcasters and everything. Mm -hmm. I prefer to follow the news and look yeah. at events. And Iraq has been working, I would think, close to a year and a half, two years to redo their whole economy. Mm -hmm. They're the milestone of how all mm -hmm. nations are going to revamp their economies, bring back their own currencies and start learning and trading with their own currencies. And you were talking just a minute ago about the 20th. Uh, I believe the budget has to be finished by the end of the year mm -hmm. because on January 1st, they're no longer going to use the US dollar. Right. The US dollar will be non-viable. And they have just now worked with the other UAE nations the United Arab Nations, mm -hmm. and they're trading in their own currency. And one of the biggest things that I saw, they're crashing this dollar so quickly right now. Um, uh, President Putin was just in uh, Saudi Arabia, and he just got done on the 6th of December, signing contracts for all the BRICS nations that are already in the BRICS nations uh, to trade in their own currency. Right. The dollar is dead. There's no more oil back in the dollar. So we have to look at events and see how this is playing out and see what's going forward. So one of the other great events that I just saw is China just made, I can't remember how many millions of dollar purchase of oil using the gold backed yen. Mm -hmm. So we see that the dollar is being de-dollarized, I guess you would call it. <laughs> Correct. Correct. The dollar is dying. And then we just see what was the HR bill that they have to pass and sign in January mm -hmm. for crypto. And right. crypto will no longer be a currency, but it'll be a commodity. Mm -hmm. That's very important, guys. So we just have to keep watching the signs as we move forward. And the writing is on the wall. Everything is being taken off anything that is not gold back standard. And the goal, everything is being wiped out. Pretty soon we're going to be on all gold back standard, one-to-one. -one. Exactly. Well put in. Thank you for that. 
Um, it's interesting because yesterday, I think it was yesterday morning, we posted on our Telegram channel about uh, Javier Malay, the new president of uh, Argentina, is uh, basically devaluing the peso at roughly 50%, which is a pretty big haircut. Um, and I kind of wondered why he was doing that. I've sat back and pondered it. And it's sort of my contention that one of the main drivers is maybe to take that currency out of circulation and bring in a new one. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. I think it's very possible because what else did we see about him? He just he just barely got into the presidency and there was a big video. He cut the government in half. He definitely cut it in half. And immediately he's taking out their central bank. Mm -hmm. So how can you take out their central bank? You have to crash the crash the, the, the peso. And yeah. then you have to rebuild it just like Iraq just got done doing. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Um, and other than Iraq, uh, as you're looking at the events, and, and I agree, we do the same thing. We're looking for events, not dates and rates, you're putting puzzle pieces together to help our, our faithful followers uh, be able to, you know, get the, the truth and, and draw their own conclusions so that they can make moves accordingly. Other than Iraq, what other nations are kind of coming across your desk or across your attention that you're watching closely? Colombia, Brazil. Um, India has not been a lot in the news, mm -hmm. but China has really been in the news, you know, trading in their new uh, currency mm -hmm. of gold back in. So these are just events that I'm seeing. And then other events that I'm seeing is Russia. Uh, Russia ha held a lot of debt for certain third world com uh, countries. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw Russia forgive billions of dollars in debt. Billions of dollars in debt. Yep. I also saw, I forget who it was, also forgive debt. I think maybe it was China. They also forgave debt. So this is all very interesting. I also see a lot coming out of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, many of these African countries are now doing coups against the government mm -hmm. because who controls Africa? You, the, the United Kingdom, England, and their governments. Yeah. And they're re restructuring their whole entire you know, economy. They're taking back their natural resources. We also see many other countries right now who are in the, the very push stage to start mining again their own natural resources. Right. Because this is what's going to back the economy. Absolutely, and it's funny that you mentioned, I'm glad you said that about Africa, uh, because we, we key in on a lot here on our channel about Zimbabwe, particularly the bonds, the AA series 2008 and AB, um, for those keeping track, and then also the agro checks. But uh, I think it was just yesterday, Somalia was approved by the IMF for $1.5 in debt relief. So that kind of touches nicely over what you were discussing. Yeah. So just keep eyes on events. Don't worry about dates because all of this has to fall into place. Mm -hmm. And all nations have to start this reevaluation, um, like probably at the same time, because What's happened is the world has been inflated so badly. Mm. Every single person in this world is devastated and practically living in poverty. And something has got to change. So we're seeing how long it took Iraq to redo their currency. It will take a year and a half, two years. So my perspective on all of this is that what we're seeing is we're seeing a milestone in what's happening. So we're gonna have to be released some funds. And I believe the humanitarian projects are going to be the buffer while every single nation starts to rebuild their economies. Hmm. This is just my personal opinion. Sure, well, that's why we brought you on because of your knowledge base. Uh, it's interesting that you touch on timing because I've always kind of told my audience my personal take on it is that this wealth transfer is not a tsunami, but a series of waves because primarily God, God wants his people to be able to get in. And it, as you would under, I'm sure you would agree, uh, the overwhelming majority of the world does not know about this, right? On a, on a, a conscious mindset. 
So it's about 1% of us that really are aware and then taking steps to, you know, get skin in the game and, and be a part of this. So I feel that God's people are going to have time to get in this because many people will miss out on the dinar and the dong and the, the rupee and all that. So we just kind of wanted your overview on maybe that perspective. Well, we realize the first, you know, RVs that are going to go through, you're supposed to be able to go to a redemption center with what you own. But like they said, there's going to be a lot of people who are holding this currency who will never, ever get a notice. But that is never going to stop because all these banks in America are closing. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing and videos of what people are posting is the banks are no longer banks. They're wealth management okay. centers. Correct. So everybody in the world will have an opportunity Right. to go to a wealth manager and set up their accounts once everything is brought to the light. Mm -hmm. That's very important what you said. Thank you for that. Because um, I didn't script you ahead of that. That's just your own conclusion. But I've told people that your historical replication, when this happened, you know, with uh, the Quai de Dinar or Germany in the 40s, there was 90 days at least for this to happen. So people will have the time and will we'll have proper abilities to prepare and so forth and, and other people will chip in and help and so forth last question on this for now because we could obviously go on about this subject alone for days you had mentioned colombia which i thought was was good that you brought that up because we get that question occasionally uh and you were talking about other south american countries do you include in that uh, a, a question we get a lot is the venezuela boulevard which i've addressed do you include that in the mix as well well yes it would be in the mix it's only obvious maybe it might not be in the first mix Mm -hmm. But like you said, this has to come in waves. Yes. So maybe the first wave is only going to be the yen and the dong or the diner, or, you know, we don't know what the first wave is going to entail. Right. But I do believe that all the currencies that people have purchased over the years, it's going to not be able to be exchanged all at once. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're going to start slowly with one or two of the, 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 um, currencies yeah. and then maybe six months or eight months down the road they'll add another one and another one right. but we just have to sit back and sort of see and how it's gonna you know play out because Absolutely. once it happens everybody's under nda so we won't hear any more chatter as long as we're hearing a bunch of noise right now um we can't really you know i say bank on what the noise says we can only bank on events and what we see happening in real life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anne. That's great. Okay, so now turning our attention to the next part of your expertise is um, bonds. We talk a lot about in this channel, most people know the Chinese bonds, the railway bonds, uh, the Zim bonds, of course. Uh, but that's not the bonds you're referring to. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that and, and tie that into your book, Bonds for the Win, what your specialty and focus is? Okay, so... We know that there's more bonds than just bonds from the government, treasury bonds, you know, whatever you want to call them. Okay, we also know that everybody who goes to prison has to be bailed out. Well, the amount of money is absolutely ridiculous. So they go to a bails bondman and they give a percentage of the, the, the money to the bails bondman who gives a bond to the prison to allow the prisoner to get out. We also know that in all laws, statutes, codes, and constitutions of 50 states, everybody who's an elected or an appointed uh, public official must carry a bond. Well, that bond is a security bond. So for, uh, for say, um, you're the governor of some state you have done something that has harmed everybody in your state. That bond would protect all the people in your state against what you've done, and they can make claims against your bond. So what we found out in Bonds for the Win is everybody is supposed to be bonded, but what's happened behind the scenes and in the background and everything has been hidden which Bonds for the Win brought out to the light that these people are not bonded. Judges are not bonded. 
Attorneys are not bonded. Uh, court cases are not bonded. All this should be bonded uh, for the security of the people. So what have they done? They have gone in behind our backs and opened up a risk management department in every state, 50 states, and they've created an insurance policy. And when we break down the insurance policy from the writer of the policy, we find out that seven to eight different insurance companies are all involved in the writer. Well, then you start reading the insurance policies and there's really no guarantee that anything can be done uh, if these people harm or hurt you. So when we were going after the insurance companies for the bonds and the bonding clause inside the insurance policy, we were denied every single claim because they say inside the policy, which is true, that if you uh, create a law or you harm a person, that you're personally liable for it. So the only way that we can get any of the government officials, uh, school board members or anybody is to personally file lawsuits against them for personal liability. Interesting, interesting. How do you see, because we're, 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 we're talked a minute ago with the economy making, you kind of like I always talk about parallel economies, parallel politics, and I guess you could presuppose parallel restructuring of bonds. How do you see that current business, well, maybe business model is the right term, but current model that's being in, in implemented so far that you've talked about, how do you see that changing in the coming months and years? Well, we have to go back to the original U.S. Treasury. And we have to go way back to the Constitution, the original U.S. Treasury. In the Treasury, it definitely states that these people must be bonded. And they had, it was very low back then, like $200 or $300. It was, you know, some of them were $50, things like this. But they had to buy the bonds through the Treasury. Uh, in order to, you know, hold their public offices and things like this. Well, I don't know what changed. Or, well, I do know what changed. When the Treasury literally handed over and was incorporated by the Federal Reserve, that lost all avenue for the Treasury, you know? So we see the executive orders, we see the Congress orders, you know, from 1933, you know, forward where they just gave the U.S. Treasury to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve incorporated the United States Treasury. Even though we know that the Federal Reserve is actually a corporation mm -hmm. because we found their corporation papers from London and from the United States. And so a corporation incorporates a government entity. Well, does that mean that this government entity is also a corporation? Well, it does, because we also have found the corporate documents for the United States of America mm -hmm. and the corporation of the United States of America. So we have to sort of try to figure out and replace history. And I did a major uh, study on the history and I've read, I can't even tell you how many congressional records, Congress records, um, all the bankruptcies and everything that has been done. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty extensive. I, I, I have some idea what you're talking about. Cause like, you know, for example, in an indirect way, uh, the OFAC list, which, you know, sanctions a lot of countries from doing business. And a lot of that's corrupt, obviously like the, the current corporate model, but there's a, it's supposed to be a system of checks and balances, but for whom, right? It's for the corporation. It's not for we, the people. So would it be with that in mind, would you say it's, it's reasonably fair to say that all these things we're talking about are sort of intercorrelated intersect? Yes, I would basically say they are. And what I'm seeing or what I'm going to believe is they're going to have to write a brand new constitution. Because the original constitution, uh, according to what happened in 1783 mm -hmm. with the Paris Treaty, uh, the constitution was really written for the king of 
England, England yeah. as a debt certificate or a debt promise to pay back the money from the war. Right. Yeah, because like like we talk about here, common parlance in the U.S. As you know, got to pay my bills, right? But let's take the derivation of the word bill. It really goes back to maritime law, a bill of lading, where people were sold like goods and services on a ship, and they either had to you know rectify that bill or not consent for it, and you know that kind of ties into the tax system as well. You know, if you think about it, that another correlation there. So. Last question on this subject. Um, Texas, as I'm sure you've heard recently last week, uh, this came from um, Bill Holter on the X-22 Spotlight report last week. He, he was one of the first to break it, uh, that I heard anyway, that uh, Texas got enough signatures to kind of test out their, their, their residents to see if it would pass. They needed 97,000 signatures and they got well over 100,000 to agree to secede from the union and become the republic. With that getting ready to happen sometime in, we believe, early 24, do you think that sets a precedent for the new constitution? Oh, I definitely do. Because you know what? If you really want to study history and you really want to understand, we had 13 colonies, mm -hmm. the original 13 colonies. They were not states. They had no state name. They were all republics mm -hmm. until they wrote that constitution. And inside of there, now everybody is state of such and such. They're no longer a republic. They already took that away from us a long time ago. And when we joined, or these new states were supposed to join the union as their own separate sovereign state, mm -hmm. they were manipulated. Mm. That's so a, I believe every single state has got to resign from this union mm -hmm. and reform their republic. If you ask me, I believe that is the only way to do this. Everybody has to rewrite their constitution. Everybody has to re-examine what happened to them. And everybody has to learn the histories of their state and how they did this so it can't happen again. Yeah, it's a good point. And if so, in a sense, we're not just getting an economic reset, we're getting a political and a constitutional reset as well. Yes, we need it. We yeah. also need a law reset. Because if we look at it, who are supposed to be sovereigns? And who are supposed to be non sovereigns that are supposed to be answering to the sovereigns? They flip this on us. Mm -hmm. The government once you become a government entity or an elected body, you are no longer a sovereign citizen or a sovereign. Let's get, let's keep citizen out of it, a sovereign. Okay. You now have given up your sovereignty to be in office. Once you resign from office, you have, you recuperate your, your sovereignty. So the governments have always been non-sovereign and have always supposed to answer to the sovereign. Well, don't ask me when, but it's been going on for the last 150 years or probably longer. Hmm. It's been slowly being reversed. The people have lost their sovereignty and the government has gained sovereignty and now we're non-sovereign. Mm. So we have to flip the tables. We have yeah. to flip it back. Absolutely right. And just <laughs> as you were sharing in about the 13 colonies, a thought came to mind. It's all about symbolism too, right? Because 13 is a cabal number for those who know. So they kind of built it into their predictive programming, what they were going to do. They just never told us. And now we're, we're finding out and taking steps accordingly. So as these things correlate, one of the last things I want to talk to you about in today's pro, uh, the podcast is... Uh, the subject of trust. We've been covering this lately with other people, so I'm really keen to get your take on it because what our mission is to help our, our subscribers be proactive before the RV happens, like you said, in the natural, when it hits real time. Um, there's been a contentious debate, obviously, do I need a trust? Should I have a trust before the RV, after the RV? There's lots of opinions on it. Uh, would love for you to weigh in on that and what type of trust to which you subscribe. Okay, the two basic trusts that we know are revocable and irrevocable. Mm -hmm. 
we can only have one irrevocable trust. I mean, one revocable trust, excuse me. We can have a multitude of irrevocable trusts, as many as we want to create. The revocable trust, if you want to look at it, it's a passage. It's like a roadway from the public to the private, from the private to the public. So you operate in both realms at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I always start all of my students out with revocable trust. Because once you establish your revocable trust, you will go to a bank with a certain amount of documents and you'll open up a private trust bank account. You are the trustee of your revocable trust. You are the grantor and the trustee. You cannot be the beneficiary. So I have seen out there so many people saying, you're all three. You're the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiary. No, you cannot be the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. What happens if you die and you're the only beneficiary? Where does your estate go? It's not possible. Mm -hmm. So basically, I try to explain to people when you run a trust, you actually wear three hats. So you're wearing the hat of the grantor. You're the one making the decisions to, you know, set up this trust, how you want it set up and how you want to make your changes to it. So remember in a revocable trust, you get to make changes. In an irrevocable trust, it's usually set in stone unless you have some very specific clauses inside of it. Mm -hmm. so that you can make very minuscule changes to it right okay so then you are a second hat you're the tr the trustee of the trust so you're ministering the trust you're taking care of the grantor so when you're taking care of the grantor for example <coughs> the grantor wants to buy a piece of property so the grantor or, or let's go a simpler way. The grantor needs uh, a new dishwasher for the home. His dishwasher blew up and he needs a new dishwasher. As the trustee, you are responsible for looking at the, pro the problem. So you examine your problem. Okay, your dishwasher's out. This lowers the value of your trust uh, in the monetary system. And if we do not replace it, you know, we can lose some equity in our trust, which as me, I cannot allow you to do that. So yes, I need to, from the trust fund, purchase this dishwasher and have it installed in the grantor's home. So now the grantor becomes a beneficiary. And think about it, because the grantor is benefiting from the trust to take care of what he needs while he's alive. Mm -hmm. That's why I say you wear three hats. Mm -hmm. But when the grantor dies, the trust becomes irrevocable. And now the trustee has to actually take care of the true beneficiaries and distribute the trust. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, would that, or how, I should say, how would that entail in terms of the property itself? Um, having the proper trust, you know, help you avoid property taxes and that sort of thing? How do you approach that? Well, with property taxes and things like this, then again, you need to do your own study mm -hmm. because most of the states in the United States are under federal land deeds. Mm -hmm. They own the land deeds. So it's on meets and bounds. How do they tax you on property? Land description by the state, which if you want, you can go and change that mm -hmm. very easily by looking up meets and bounds and finding the law of your state that, that definitely states that these federal land deeds and federal land descriptions outweigh their land descriptions. And this is how they tax you. I mean, sorry to say it, but that's how it, does, that's how it works. Yeah, I mean, because I think a lot of people don't realize there's no law in place that says you have to record the deed. People just do it out of practice, just like many people don't realize, some do, but not everybody realizes that uh, individuals 
are not corporations and are not subject to taxes. Only corporations are, and they put us under that. And so once we reclaim our rights, not our freedoms and privileges, we can take the appropriate steps. And that's where, you know, leaders like you become indispensable to help people kind of steer and navigate that process. So I really appreciate you sharing, you know, the knowledge you share today. Um, and it's been a real privilege because I know your time is valuable and you've got a lot on your plate. Um, I'll turn it over the last words to you. Uh, last parting thoughts for our audience and where can people find out about your work? Okay, um, I do teach trust classes and I do work with Floyd from the Fearless Floyd Show. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the website, thefearlessfloydshow.com, you can find a trust book that I've written that's uh, 569 pages. It has 11 different examples of trust. It has trust letters and all the documents you need but and also step-by-step -step information uh i want to make the book very available to anybody and we're only charging 249 dollars for the book and we're offering a great promo right now for christmas where you can get the book and also access to our trust classes for a very low price so visit the website the fearlessfloydshow.com and you can find the information there also with Floyd, he and I did a 19 video series talking about trusts. They're all free. They're all up on his YouTube channel. So drop in and take a look. That's great. In the website, is there a phone number or anything for anybody to call you if they want to do one-on-one -on -one consultation? Okay. They have to book that because I don't live in America. Okay. So I don't think people would like to call me in French <laughs> Polynesia, Tahiti. I think it would cost them eight or nine dollars a minute to talk to me. Oh. So okay. it would probably be better if you booked a consultation through Floyd's website okay. and we do it through a Zoom consultation. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And thank you. It's been a real privilege and honor to have you here. Uh, I want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holiday and New Year. And we look forward to having you back on in the future. Thanks again. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me today. Our pleasure.